¿Dónde vas a poner? Al día de hoy, ¿no? ¿Cuánta que? Es allò que no es veu res. Well, welcome to this round table of the Universitat Politécnica de Catalunya, UPC. My name is Ariadna Llorenç. I am professor at the UPC and director of the Science Institute. Well, today we are going to talk about artificial intelligence. And to do that, I have a group of philosophers, engineers, uh, the, um, researchers, professors, uh, people, experts in robotics, in algorithmic, in ethics. So today we're going to talk a little bit about which are the main uh, problems also, what we're going to have in the near future that is going to make our life possibly different. And intelligent artificial, artificial intelligence, AI, is going to be part of our lives. So uh, we don't have much time, and we have a lot to talk about. Let us start with Karma Torres. Excuse me. Hi. Karma Torres, she is a writer and research professor at the Institute of Robotics and Industrial Computing, CSIC, UPC. Karma, in just five minutes, can you explain us how may the benefits of AI be enhanced and the risks be mitigated? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I will start by saying that I work in assistive robotics. Uh, for example, having robots to help people that have uh, disabilities like reduced mobility to dress or to put shoes or to eat and these conditions my very positive view of technology because uh, I think the the benefits are a lot and we have to exploit them and of course there are risks that we have to mitigate as you were saying how to mitigate the, the risk. Sometimes the media uh, exaggerate a lot both the, the, the findings of AI and also the risks and the bad uh, side of AI. And the way to counteract this is to, uh, in, in two ways. One is to regulate many institutions many governments, many associations, nowadays are um, designing principles and uh, norms that, for instance, robots have to satisfy in order to be commercialized. This is very, very important. But even more important than this is um, education. Education at all levels, at the level of um, high school, because children start to be very um, motivated and engaged with technology. So it's important that they know the, the benefits and the risks that they are taking. But also at the level of universities, especially technological degrees in which uh, students learn how to program, so computer science, engineering, etc. It's very important that they include um, a uh, course on ethics or on values and, eth and, and technology and so on. In the States, as a matter of fact, this is in the standard curriculum. There are ma mandatory courses on professional ethics. And here it is starting, but I would say that it's not very, very common yet. And uh, in the, uh, for the general public also, I think science fiction can be a good tool to uh, design 
escenarios and situations and discuss and see what, uh, what scenarios we like to go towards them and which we like to avoid. And some of these courses are based on, on, on science fiction. And, well, in particular, I designed uh, materials to teach an ethics in robotics and AI course, both at the university level, it was developed in English, and it's being taught in several universities in the States, and also here in Barcelona and, and Catalonia in general, and also, um, well, I don't know what I was going to say uh, again, uh, once more. Uh. That you have prepared material. Sorry? You have prepared ah, the, material. the material, yes. There is a material that is also for high schools. So some professors uh, are starting to teach with, with these materials. Thank you, Maite. <laughs> so I think five minutes, I don't know. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Karma. Now I'm going to, to introduce Ramon López de Mantras. He's research professor of the Spanish National Re Research Council, CSIC, and director of the Artificial Intelligence Research Institute of CSIC too. Ramon, only with five minutes too. <laughs> Are you able to decide if a machine can be creative? Mm. Okay, welcome everyone and good afternoon. Yes, uh, when you talk about creativity, this is a very complex question, and that's what Marvin Minsky used to say, a sweet, sweet case word. These words that can have many meanings, that can encompass different views and different meanings. So these are concepts which are very, very tricky. I would, I, when I talk about creativity, I like to make clear that there are, we have to talk about degrees of creativity. Creativity is a matter of degree. Everyone is creative. Well, all human beings are creative, that's clear. Uh, otherwise, you wouldn't be able to solve complex problems. When it comes to solving a complex problem, at some point you need to do something that has to do with create, being creative. Okay? Um, but not only human beings, other living beings are also very creative. At quite high level of creativity, I don't know if you have heard about uh, a crow called Betty, Betty the Crow, a new Caledonian crow that was studied by ethologists at the University of Oxford. If you Google Betty the crow, and there are several uh, videos over there, there is one which is absolutely astonishing because this crow makes an invention that human beings took many years to invent. It, it invents the concept of a hook, a hook to catch, to catch some food in a, in a container. Just look at this, at this video, and you will be impressed that after looking at this video, you ask yourself, creativity is something that is exclusive to human beings? And of course, the, the answer is absolutely not, right? So creativity is something that is much more common than we think of. When you talk about creativity, it's like, sounds like a, or something it make a, a myth of what is creativity. It's, not, it's a form of problem solving. And when you have the pressure to solve a problem, you become creative many, in many, many occasions along, along your life. Now, can a machine be creative? Well, if we take a, 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 a definition of creativity that in computational creativity is quite accepted, which is coming up with a, a new, something new, by combining existing elements, okay, according to some rules of constraints or some model, and then this thing that you create that is new has to have a value. That is very important. Yeah, to, for something to be considered creative and having, let's say, social acceptance, it has to have a value. Even if the values are just aesthetical, like, you know, like a painting or, or music, the value has not to be a value that of economical value, although also it has economical value afterwards, but it's been the main reason might not be economical, for example, right? Or practical in some sense. Uh, when you come to this uh, definition of creativity, combining existing elements in a new way, something that never before has been thought of, a new combination of the existing elements, then this a machine can do that quite easily. So there are machines, there are examples in music, music composition, music uh, performance, music improvisation even, that is done by machines. 
or f in fine arts, paintings that are done machines. That, uh, uh, but what these things do, what these systems do, they learn a model and a style, for example. They learn a musical style or they learn a, mu a, a style of painting. And once they have learned the model, they are capable of reproducing uh, this style. Okay? For example, there is, again, Google, the next Rembrandt, the next Rembrandt. You will see an impressive movie about a machine that is capable of painting a Rembrandt using a 3D, a 3D printer. So it's not all strong in a screen. So it's a real painting, right, with, 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 uh, with, uh, that looks like or on canvas, on canvas. And it's amazing, because even critics and experts in Rembrandt, they, they say that this could be a Rembrandt. Of course, they know that it's not but it's uh, the, the style of Rembrandt. But what a computer cannot do, a machine cannot do, and we humans, some, not everyone, can do, is very high level uh, forms of creativity that imply breaking rules. Breaking rules, okay? Schoenberg broke the rules of having a tonal center in a music composition and invented the decaphonic music that the 12 semitones of a scale can be used the same probability of appearing in the composition, which breaks with the concept of having a central tonality in music. Cubism in painting. Cubism, instead of having only one vanishing point in the painting, has an indeterminate number of vanishing points. And again, uh, the cubism broke, the cubists, they broke established rules in painting. This type of creativity that implies, implies breaking rules and inventing new styles is out of reach of, of machines. And in my opinion, it will be out of reach of machines uh, for a very long time. Perhaps they will never be able to do that. I don't know. Thank you, Ramon. Now. It's the turn of Pilar de Lunde. She is professor of logic at the philosophy department of the, the Universitat Autònoma de Barcelona, and at the present is the principal investigator of the Resercaixa 2018 project AFIL. Pilar, can AI make a world more ethical? Okay. What do you think? Thanks, Ariana. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Okay, it seems very strange to uh, speak of war here in this context of music. On, we are <laughs> but I think it's important because it's uh, related to um, all the things that uh, will appear in, in this uh, discussion. No? So at the first side, uh, to say if it's the war can be ethical or no, my answer is clearly no, because my point of view is that it's a contradiction to speak of war and ethics together. So this is my point of view. Uh, and from that, uh, we have uh, to be aware, I think, that uh, we are in a other context because using artificial intelligence, the war goes beyond traditional war. So in this context, we believe that some people argue that, uh, in fact, uh, it artificial intelligence can make war more ethical, more effective, of course, I, I say for killing. And uh, I think we have to um, present arguments against that. And, um, this is the idea, though, to, to speak of that. If we were speaking of art, uh, science fiction, artificial intelligence, but when we speak of uh, science fiction in, in work, artificial intelligence, sometimes the, the image of uh, Terminator appears. But in reality, we can think more uh, like something like uh, the military drones, for instance. So it's a more accurate image. In this case, there is something that is cheap, that uh, it's easy or easier than other weapons to, to build and can be used in non-combat areas, which, is, which make these uh, weapons very uh, dangerous. Uh, sometimes uh, you can say that uh, some people call this kind of uh, weapons uh, killer robots. Not everyone. Perhaps the community, the scientists prefer to say little, uh, little uh, autonomous weapons. I think it's more accurate, but of course, they are not fully autonomous. There's uh, only one degree of autonomy on that. Perhaps the, the name is not good enough. It's very commercial, but it's not good enough because the killers are not the robots. They are not autonomous. They don't decide. Uh, we have to refer to the people. So uh, from the point of view of philosophy, there is an accountability gap that we have to discuss about that. No? So uh, my point of view is uh, that uh, since the same community is aware, or part of the community, 
we have to try to ban uh, the so-called uh, uh, killer robots because uh, we have in, a, in an area that we cannot prevent uh, something if we don't ban it. I think that the situation can be similar to, uh, to the chemical weapons. Uh, at some times, uh, people discover that uh, we cannot uh, afford to have a war with chemical weapons. So it is the same in this case. We have, in 2015, the community react. Uh, a lot of people, uh, I, I assume the people who are here, who have uh, read, uh, write, sorry, uh, a manifesto, and sign a manifesto against uh, the killer robots. And then there is a campaign uh, that continuously has us, the governments, to, to do this one, for instance, the United Nations, the Secretary General has uh, said, okay, I am for this one. And I think we have to take action because it, even it, in this context, it's a bit far from us, it's not so far. And in some places, it's uh, really dangerous to do that. So I think from a point of view of philosophy, it is important not uh, thinking only uh, theoretically, but also uh, taking action. No? So I think uh, the same in, as uh, Karma has said, the people who uh, have the opportunity to give classes, uh, we have to use uh, science fiction, for instance, uh, short stories as Codename Delphi, or other stories that relate uh, artificial intelligence and, and war, or other aspects of violence, for instance, that uh, we have this opportunity that we can mm, make the students uh, think about that because we have, I think it's urgent to take action on that. It's not on something that is okay, it's more uh, ethical. No, no, there is no, for some people like us, there is no debate. In, in this case, we have to ban this, this kind of weapons. Great, great, Pilar, thanks a lot. Now I'm going to present Maite Lope. She's artificial intelligence scientist and university professor also at the University of Barcelona, La UB. Maite, tell us, what if AI had already transformed our lives, our reality, by making decisions for us? How decisions are made? Okay, hello everyone. Uh, yeah, this question I think is very interesting because when we talk about artificial intelligence, in general we think about the future like anything that will come. But in fact, we have been doing research in artificial intelligence for some years now, and each time something, uh, an algorithm is proposed that works properly, then the magic is gone, and we don't say it's artificial intelligence anymore. It's like, no, this is a computation. This is not artificial intelligence. So we always face this problem of, yeah, artificial intelligence will come in the future, will change our future, uh, which might be true, but the, the important thing uh, we might be aware of is that some of artificial intelligence algorithms are already on, on our daily lives. And for example, in the case of music, uh, it's quite mature, all the development that has been done around the recommendation of music. So there are many algorithms from artificial intelligence that have been applied in streaming platforms for music for, for a long time. So mm, they, are take, they are making decisions for us because uh, they are deciding what will be the next song that we will listen. Maybe it sounds like a very small decision, oh, it's not important, I don't need to think about it. But the thing is that we are surrounded by applications that are making decisions for us in every day. So we should think about what does it mean to have a machine to take decisions for us. It's not good or wrong, it's just that we have to be aware of that and to know how these decisions are made. Okay, so we should be aware, and, and in the case of music and recommendations, how these decisions are made. So they can be made in different, taking different uh, aspects into consideration. So I am sure that uh, you are aware of Amazon. When you go to Amazon and you buy something, they say, oh, some other people has also bought these things. So this is a recommendation. Uh, Spotify recommends a list for the week, for the day, many recommendations of music, for example. Uh, the idea behind is that this recommendation is made based on actions of other users and profiles of preferences of users. So if someone that is similar to you is listening to some Thing, you might also be interested of also listening to this. So they recommend you to, to, to listen to, the, to this, this specific song. And it makes 
sense, it works, it's handy, it's perfect. But we need to think about this. What does it mean? It means that we only take those uh, songs that are similar to the people that are similar as to us. To us. So what happens? That we end up in a very small world with everybody is listening the same songs in the same group. Uh, for music, that might not be a big deal, but for example, when you think about political opinions or pieces of news in the network, uh, that makes uh, more disturbing. It's more disturbing. So we have to be aware that when we are taking those recommendations, which are fine, we are closing our world, and we have to be aware of that. So, uh, for example, uh, Spotify has has launched a project. Um, uh, trying to, to provide music from the world. So if you are from located in a country, they provide you music from very, very different countries or very different origins, trying to, to in introduce this diversity because they are aware that we are getting polarized, we are getting in small communities. But it's not the only answer. It's true that um, recommenders in music, they are also considering other things, not only actions. They also consider the, the, the um, expert's opinion. For example, in Pandora, they have a lot of experts in music classifying songs in one uh, style or the other, and so on. So recommendations can be also be made based on experts. And there are also quite recent uh, deep learning methods, so one of those artificial intelligence uh, algorithms that are very um, used these days, that analyze the songs and try to find uh, similar songs based on the, on, the, on the patterns of the music and also related to the text or, or words related to this music. So uh, we, we can open and include diversity. We can use different methods. Uh, but we need to be aware how these decisions are done. So as users or consumers of all these uh, applications applying or taking, making decisions for us using artificial intelligence methods, we have to be aware and we should ask, what are the criteria? Are you offering me this song because it's similar, because someone, my friend, is listening to it, or because a company is promoting this song? We need to be aware of, of those things. That's my Thank you, Maite. And now, to close this part, this first part of the round table, Uriel Quintana, writer and researcher. He's PhD in humanities from the Pompeu Fabra University and a professor of the chair of ethics and Christian thought of EQS, Ramon Llull University. Uriel, do you think that AI will make us more free, more autonomous? Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, I think we have already started to answer this question. Just you might have just said that some, decision, uh, some decisions are being made for us, or at least in form of suggestions. No? And you also mentioned, uh, Pilar, that um, uh, we have to judge the risks of, uh, of artificial intelligence. I think the main risk of artificial intelligence is depriving us of our freedom of choice, of our ability of making decisions of our own decisions. No? One example is that. Another example is uh, what we do today, even today, uh, when we take the car and we have to go from A to B. You know? Especially if the place uh, is unknown to us, uh, what we do is to resort to Google and to, uh, to have our trip planned for ourselves. You know? Whereas in the old days, we had to make an effort to try to know the place we were going, even through maps. But we had to get familiar with the names. We had to ask other people how to get there. So traveling so was a kind of a challenge. And uh, it took an effort and, and took a lot of attention. And then when you, when you finally got there, <laughs> you, could be, you could feel proud of yourself. You had a sense of accomplishment. You know? Now today, traveling uh, has become a question of routine. And all the work, all the previous work, and all, basically all the work that you have to do while you travel is done, is done by the machines. And if we think of uh, the automatic car, uh, I mean the self-driving car, uh, that will increase the sense of having nothing to do, you know? of being excluded of your own activities, which is a form of losing your autonomy. Because after all, being free or being autonomous implies effort, 
implies attention, implies the possibility of failure. Mm -hmm. It implies also, uh, I mean, a sense of accomplishment when everything goes wrong, goes right, or even if it goes wrong. You no, know, you have a sense of, uh, in the end, you have a sense of accomplishment or failure. So that is what, what is uh, what life is about, having these kind of feelings. You no, know? so if a machine can do all of this for you much better than yourself, then you are actually losing your, your freedom or, and your autonomy. You know? Even today, uh, what we do most of the time is, in our jobs, I mean, is to finish the machine to do their job so that we can step in. For example, when you take the elevator, this is not artificial intelligence, I know. <laughs> But it's an example of I have to go up. What I have to do is to wait the ele for the, the elevator to come, to get in, and to wait for the elevator to. When you take a train, just the same, no? So and then your life is a series of periods of waiting for the machine to the to the job for you, no? So what would happen when the machine can also make your decisions? Not only take you from A to B, but also tell you you should go to A, uh, or you sorry, you should go to B, and also you should take this, no? Take this route or whatever. So at some point, it's somehow scary, no? The possibility of giving up your decisions and, and having everything planned from, uh, ahead from you by machines. Thank you, Oriol. Now let's begin the final part of, of this debate, and let's, I'm going to give you an open question uh, so uh, you can who wants to start is able to start it's open to you and the background question will be are we showing fear of artificial intelligence do you think that perhaps we are giving messages and the media also that are saying no this is bad um, let's change everything we are going in the wrong direction what do you think about that it's open. <laughs> yeah, I think there is a lot of confusion about the re what is artificial intelligence real, the real AI, the real. Ex I mean, w there is lots of lots of uh, uh, over expectations and exaggerations about the capacities of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is still in the very early stages. Uh, it's only 60 years old. I mean, 60 years for a for a field of, of knowledge of science is nothing. It's nothing. Think of physics or mathematics or chemistry. You know, it's like it's like the <laughs> it's like in chemistry when they they were pretending to come out to to transform uh, lead in gold. I mean, it's like alchemy. It's, we are almost at the alchemist level of artificial intelligence. That is extremely limited. Extremely limited. It bothers me very much, and I don't like to when it co it's when you compare it with the human intelligence. I think they are very incom incomparable uh, types of intelligence, different intelligences. I try. I tend to call instead of artificial intelligence, I tend to call what we have now as competence without comprehension. We have machines that are very competent, that can very can be trained, can be programmed to do something extremely well, much better than humans, like playing chess or playing go or even, uh, you know, diagnosing, um, uh, looking at a medical image and, and spotting some, I don't know, some tumor or something in a, in a medical image. But this is extremely, extremely limited and concrete and very narrow, narrow artificial intelligence that can go very far, that's true, but it lacks anything that has to do with general intelligence. What it cannot relate something that learns with something that has learned before. It's not an incremental learning. It's not relational learning. It, it suffers from catastrophic forgetting. When you train a system to learn something else, it forgets completely what it has learned before. And of course, these are issues that might be, I think, catastrophic forgetting in particular, it, it will, I'm sure it will be at some point more or less well, well solved, and we will have more and more multitasking systems, more and more general artificial intelligence, but uh, still, we, we, they will be very different from our intelligence. There are many things that separate artificial intelligence from human intelligence, and we should take the, all this, 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 this concept into account. And I, I tend to talk about artificial intelligence, the future of artificial intelligence, 
as, uh, as a synergy between human and machine intelligence, working together, each one with, with its complementarities, and one complements the other. And let's lead, lead, lead to the human what it's the human can do much better. It's uh, recovering from failure, uh, planning in an, in an undeterministic world, and, and let's leave the, 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 com the computer to do things that is much better than humans. But don't mix it. Take advantage of both, and working together, the result is much better than, than each one of them separately. But I, I, I am very well. Uh, I am also uh, very glad that you pointed the fact that uh, uh, actually the machines that we call we we claim to have artificial intelligence are not actually intelligent, no, in the human sense. But uh, with all that is written and talked about artificial intelligence, uh, you you have the sense that sense that you have in technology in general, the fact that everything that can be done will be done ultimately, eventually. Uh, it's like autonomy, uh, yes, it's, it's like technology had his own, its own autonomy. And, and for example, no, we, we were unable to prevent the creation of, in the Second World War of the at atomic bomb. And, uh, and other things have just come by their own inertia. No? And then uh, I think some, in part, is the fear that we have against artificial intelligence is justified based on this past experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, but I think perhaps it's not, um, it's not inertia, because perhaps we have to resituate the question is, who is controlling, using the tool of artificial intelligence? Sometimes we have to uh, rethink our rights, because we have to uh, live in a society with uh, machines that are artificial intelligence. Uh, questions of privacy, for instance, or autonomy that you have mentioned. But I think we have to um, ask responsibilities huh? to have uh, in some instances that can control transparency of uh, algorithms some other uh, situations in which public uh, entities can control all that. Perhaps uh, we, are, we fear the situation, but it's not the autonomy that uh, is to be feared. It's the, the loss of control or is planability of the, of the machine. Because we need, uh, for, for some purposes, medicine or uh, industrial purposes, that the machine is autonomous. But uh, there are degrees of autonomy. It's not a fully autonomy. And then we have to be able to control and, and to um, establish some laws that control people using these tools. No? For instance, the searchers or people who is, uh, there are some laws which are uh, important in Europe, but uh, we have to go beyond. No? Yeah, I think it's, it's very important that we as a society get together with artificial intelligence being developed. It's not a matter of where are we, but can we go together and, and be aware of the advances and, and, and ask how these things are done, based on what criteria do we agree with this criteria or not? Do we agree with having those weapons uh, targeting someone? Do we want this or not? As a society, we should, we should uh, be there and not thinking, oh, it's technology, we cannot do anything. No, technology is applying some criteria, some algorithms. We can explain how this works and in based on what decisions are made, and then uh, as a society say, OK, I don't use this product because it's using my data in, in a way that I don't like, so I don't use it. And we are not doing this right now, but I think we still have the opportunity to, to be there and, and, and to be watchful, no? to, to be, as a society, putting our values in, in the evolution of the machines. I would, would ask, uh, are we sowing fear of artificial intelligence because we don't want to take responsibility a bit in your direction. I mean, scientists, we have responsibility. It's not just complaining, oh, there are many problems and there are biases. There are, uh, we tend to complain sometimes. And I think we should just take the reins and, and develop the, the artificial intelligence we believe in and to make people aware of the benefits that, for instance, for the collaboration that you were mentioning, machines are good at GPS that you, let them do GPS, we can do many other things. Uh, mm. This is my view, <laughs> that sometimes, and not just scientists, but society in general, as, that they should be informed, they should try to understand better, because when you understand some, the technology, you don't fear that much. Essentially, we fear what we don't know, we, what we don't control. So I, I would <laughs> say that we all should take responsibility in these developments.
I would say just uh, now that you mentioned the GPS in, in my example, I, I think that... Sorry. No, no, it's okay. I mean, I think if we let this kind of thing colonize our lives, there is more and less and less space for our own uh, initiative and individuality. I mean, the example is very clear. I mean, obviously a machine can do things much more efficient than I can do. But in my life, I need spaces of with no efficiency at all. Uh, and there, there are a few examples of things that actually, when, when you try to move them into a space of efficiency, are worse. For example, personal relationships. I mean, if you are looking for a partner, no, a lover, maybe a machine can just study thousands of profiles faster than you, and then can give you a proposal of someone could be, could, that could be uh, fit for you, whatever. But then, in the real human relationships, the efficiency of having, in principle, someone that fits with you, it's not that important, because what is important is the real and personal interaction, and that cannot be mediated by machines, no? This this face-to-face, -face, this... Um, actually, the machine can go... It can be really, really wrong, no? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. human beings are not efficient. We make mistakes. Uh, we make things that are somehow creative in the sense that are wrong, no? So uh, I think that in order to be to have a, f a fully human life, there, are ha there, has, there have to be large patches of simplicity in our lives, places where no technology enters, no? And I think that personal relationships are, are probably the best example, but also leisure time. Hmm? Today, we, we can spend in our jobs the whole day working on the computer. And then when we get home, what, what do we do? We stand in, in front of a screen and start watching series because they are fun, because they're, they're perfectly for us. I mean, they, they have profiled us beforehand. and they. they are, but in the end, what, what, what have we done for ourselves? What, no? And I think that today, even this kind of creativity is very difficult to to do, even if I wanted to make a, a chair for myself or something like that, I, I just would not be able to do it because I cannot buy a tree or something to start with. No? So all the whole industry has already done everything for me. So obviously there are things that the machines go do better, but I don't want to do everything efficiently all the time. No, I want to be sloppy sometimes. I want to be slow as well. And then this, this, uh, there are. More and less and less space for doing that, no? even today. Mm. Yeah, somehow we have to fight to maintain the choices. Mm. Yeah, people have always have, um, have the choice to, to, to choose. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, but... <laughs> but I also doubt about the choices. For Given the example of the army, of uh, developing new weapons, uh, c can a, a powerful army in the United States, for example, be free not to develop a killer robot when China is doing it? I don't think they can. I mean, yeah. that's the called the Terminator's yeah, dilemma. Yeah. The Terminator's yeah, yeah. dilemma says that. Yeah, I, I, there was uh, one one top person from the from the Defense Department in the U.S. that I heard uh, uh, a talk. He was saying, "Well, let's assume that U.S. because of our have our concerns about." Uh, killer robots and all that, and we decide that we shouldn't do it. Can we really make this decision if we know that our enemies, he, did, he didn't mention who were the enemies, but everyone uh, more or less could, could think who were, <laughs> uh, not necessarily only sta other states, but also, uh, he was mentioning terrorism, for example. Can we avoid doing it if we know that for sure, sooner or later, at some point, it will be done by our enemies, so and I then what can we do to defend ourselves, right? Okay. It's a huge dilemma. Yeah? And, and the same I think, I think we, we need to change the model of our society yeah. in general. I mean, the, the, the yeah. we have to think in a, in a wider way, not probably in the terms of machines against the humans, but nations should work in a different way, work should work in a different way. I think we, as a society, we need to, to reflect on how we want the future to be and if we can work towards it, which is not easy, but at least we should discuss it, I think. 
Well, thank you very much. We have to finish right now, but it's been a pleasure to be with you, to be with all of you, and to share your thoughts, your ideas. What do you think? So thank you very much, and thank you to everybody. Thank you very much.